and and how can these obstacles deny what is really true because the land does belong to the native people they are the caretakers of the land and today we talked about treaties on how the treaties were designed to as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers flow and there was night and day that we would be able to use the land freely for our future generations and today the treaty was what 18 what 60 i forget what was the date 1868 it was a few years mm -hmm. before that because 1868 was a new treaty. Exactly. Time. It was the last treaty. Mm -hmm. But regardless, see, and, and then the American people and, inter and people internationally feel that the United States is honoring Indian people. And this isn't the case because they use us through what they call the Bureau of Indian Affairs in which many of our traditional people do not believe. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is just a branch of the United States government that is funded through every other kind of little project on how they want to keep the assimilation and genocide going to destroy our language and our land. And that's what it's really all about and they did a very good job of it. Because right now, living on the reservation, people think that we have it made and we're getting land lease agreements and money is coming all the time and the Indians can just kick back and take it easy. But this isn't so mm -hmm. because you go on to the reservation and you got the highest poverty in the country going on besides the ghettos and the communities. I mean, you know, it's the highest. You have, for gasoline, it's almost up to $2. For bread, it's over a dollar fifty in some of the stores. And yet all your stores and your ranches and all, all the people who are leasing the land from the Indians are white ranchers who have control of the politics that go on in the communities with your mayors and your different politicians that make up a, uh, a city council. You know, I mean, we have to deal with all these kind of confusions that completely take away from our lifestyles, our language. Just as sure as I'm sitting here talking English to you, I've been robbed my language. And this is a hurt feeling of, you know, it's a survival feeling, you know, and today... Our people on our, on our last stand to re-educate ourselves and to reclaim the land in the best way possible against all these laws and regulations and policies that have been put onto our people. It isn't a very job that we have to be forced to become citizens when we're already a nation of own in our own land. But yet we're not allowed to practice the freedom of religion and they talk about the First Amendment of the United States that it has to be honored among all people, but we see every day that it's being denied us every day. And it's not only native people, because once you've taken a people and their land base and their language, then you've conquered the people. But you, can never con you, you, you will never capture the true spirit of people's resistance to face the oppression that is being forced on them right now. Because just like the people in El Salvador, it's, an, it's a natural reaction that you must stand in defense of your land when you're an oppressed by an oppressor. That's your natural duty to stand up and defend yourself and to protect your land and to protect your women and children, such as Leonard Peltier was doing on June 26th, when men, women, and children and old people were running for their lives. As I understand it then, there was practically a reign of terror. Uh, it was a reign the, of terror. Among the goon squads that the, uh, on the with the with the people, Richard Wilson's people, in support of the, the <laughs> Bureau of Indian Affairs itself. And it still it exists true? today. Still? It, it still exists today because they're getting ready for some other moves or some kind of infiltration to discredit the people to make their move for the next big grab is what it amounts to. And how they use people, we're yet to find out, such as we did with Leonard and all the people related to his case. I mean, in a six-year process since Leonard's been incarcerated, I mean, it's going to be seven years since the shootout in mm -hmm. June this coming June. I mean, we, we have a total of 12 people who have been killed. We've had we have tens and hundreds of people who have been harassed and intimidated. And today it's continuing on with one key witness, such as the name of Myrtle Poor Bear, who was an Indian woman out of the community of Allen on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, who the FBI had used to illegally extradite Leonard from Canada under false affidavits that they forced her to sign under a protective custody plan. And the, the, the tactic there was that members of the American Indian Movement and Leonard's of the, members of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee were going to go out and kidnap her, such as we were going to take the judge. We were going to get different government officials mm -hmm. in exchange for Peltier. And, and people have to remember that we're peaceful people. You know, we understand the laws and the pressures in which we're faced, that if we violate the law, we're going to be abused through the court system and through the federal prison systems. This is, our, this is automatic for our people because we've got heads banging against those cell bars every day that we're trying to free, such as uh, Richard Marshall, who is another person in which the government used the same woman, Myrtle Poirbear, to illegally convict Marshall because he was linked up with Russell Means' activism in relation to liberating the independent the nation of Wounded Knee. Well, that, you know, yes.
whereas the other two American Indian movement leaders who were let off on the trial were able to use evidence of FBI misconduct in the whole trial. Leonard was not able to do this. No, he was not able to How do this. How come Leonard wasn't able to have the charges dismissed on the grounds of this FBI misconduct? And what wa was some of the FBI misconduct and some of the strange ca circumstances surrounding this case? Uh, we, I think we can get into a lot of time there, you know. But Leonard, uh, he was a scapegoat. He had to be the scapegoat for, because, to make an example before the people that nobody gets away with killing law enforcement agents, no matter what they do in terms of police, police brutality in the communities and on the reservations and around the world as far as that goes. But Leonard was not given due process of law, none whatsoever, because Judge Benson of the trial, uh, the Federal District Court out of Fargo, North Dakota, was very open and very biased to every motion of proof that was made for dismissal, dismissal or a new trial, okay? He, he even went through such extremes that to state, even though we had proof to show that the FBI was lying, he would say the FBI is not on trial here, Leonard Peltier is. Okay, we have to go through instances to show the state of mind on how they, on how they psyched out the jury, okay, such as with bloody autopsy pictures that were taken of the dead agents. Now, it was after the second autopsy, because it was through the second autopsy that we not only find the bloody picture mess scene in which they wavered be before the jury's faces, but we come to find out that one, each of the agents just had a bullet in them, but yet the media put out information saying that the agents were slain and riddled with bullets. Chaos. And we, you know, and things of this nature, and so they would wave this around. And today we have documents from the Freedom of Information Act files on the FBI files that were released to us mm -hmm. through that act. Uh, we have documents showing that the AR-15 and that they used in Dino and Bobby's trial as well as Leonard's trial. That's the isn't, rifle, right? That's that's the machine gun. Machine is what, gun. Yeah, this is the one that's supposed to have riddled the bullets with agents. Mm -hmm. We have a document today showing that it, was, it wasn't even the gun. It was just an excuse gun to put in its place, okay? Let alone a two twenty three shell casing in which there were thousands of them. Uh, it wasn't even the, the, the shell casing that went into the gun they used as a phony. That was the fabrication of evidence. That was the fabrication part. of materials and evidence, exhibits as they call them in the, in the trial proceedings. And they also withheld evidence they, which would have cleared. Oh yes, uh, by all means. Completely. Well, it, it was all, regardless of the information acts, it was all proven through the original trial. But there was no due process, there was prejudice, racism, and they, they had to have a conviction and they did it very openly. Even after the, you know, the trial was over, Prosecutor Haltman would come out to the media and say that, that the American uh, court system did its duty to, pro to protect the violators who, who, who uh, offend the law. You know, I mean, it was really gross to take, but, I mean, regardless, we've taken Leonard's case all the way to the Supreme Court to where our last chance today is what they call the writ of habeas corpus. And the writ of habeas corpus is what they call in legal terms a 2255 that has to introduce positive new evidence. So through the Freedom of Information Act files, we have that positive new evidence that only strengthens the old evidence, as well as exposing over 12,000 pages of FBI documentation, and, excuse me, 15. And then there's 12,000 pages that are still being withheld, which is very important. But at the present time, our, our attorneys have the writ into the typist, and it's ready to be filed very soon. Mm -hmm. And... So, but see, getting back to the writ of habeas corpus, which I really feel is important, is that it's Leonard's last leg for freedom, you know, to receive a new trial so he can gain his freedom. Because if we can't build awareness for people to become involved with constitutional rights in which we're all bound to, uh, those constitutional rights t today are being threatened to be chopped up, such as the habeas corpus right. Last year they had over 8,000 cases of writ of habeas corpus and almost every one of them were rejected or denied. If any of them did make it, then it had a little publicity behind it in order to give that, that picture to the people of the American minds that they were, doing their, they were doing their duty. But now they're trying to pass a law to do away with that right. When, once you get to the Supreme Court, you ain't going to have any last legal, legal remedies to, to gain your freedom. You know? And so we're dealing with a lot of innocent people who've already been through these experiences and just gave up the spirit to just do their time. It was claimed by the prosecution that the bullet 
that killed the FBI agents came from Leonard Peltier's gun, whereas the actual analysis by the FBI laboratory itself indicated that the bullets that killed the FBI agents did not match the gun. Well, see, it was obvious this because... This is a significant piece of new evidence that oh, it's a scandal that he was convicted on the basis of this false evidence and that the FBI withheld the um, evidence. And there was a second point, too, that it was claimed that an FBI agent saw Leonard Peltier With a shooting right. through a scope of his rifle, and it turned out that none of the rifles had a scope. Right, exactly. I was going to get into that a yeah, little bit, yeah. but... Plus the fact that even it was at night anyway, uh, or... It, well, no, it was during the day, it see. It, the it, day. Was, it happened in the early morning hours, and it mm -hmm. lasted way until into the to 6 o'clock in the afternoon to where they just had... I mean, here, you know, within minutes, within 20 minutes to a half hour, these guys are on the radio. Even the transmission radio calls and the reports were all fabricated, okay? The whole the whole story. Okay, now, within a half hour, here's the National Guard, the 82nd Airborne, Armed Personnel Carrier, State Police, City, County and City Police, BIA Police, automatically on the scene. And, you know, they, they had the, the few days from my investigations of the people, that several weeks before, they had BIA police coming in and were staking out FBI agents to know the area. Okay, now they already had plans for what was go on, what was to happen on June 26, 1975. And yet they talk about these bullets that were related to Leonard and his gun. I mean, we have to go back into simple realities of the firefight. There was a firefight had taken place. Who, 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 who killed Joe Stunts? You know, who really killed those agents has never been established. Leonard was originally charged with aiding and abetting with, along with all the defendants. But yet when he was convicted in Fargo, they, they just happened to put murder. He was, he was convicted of two, 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 two counts of second degree murder. There's been a lot of international support and interest in this case, hasn't Oh, it? yes. Uh, in 1978, when Leonard's case was in the Supreme Court, was our first trip to Europe. Uh, myself and Luke Gerwitz, who was one of Leonard's attorneys at the time, our whole purpose was to go to Amnesty International in London to see if we wouldn't, couldn't get them to uh, adopt Leonard as a political prisoner of conscience. We were very lucky to go there because they had Leonard's case buried under the table because mm -hmm. throughout all the processes of his trials, appeals, everything, all they were was observers, okay? Because they, when you're dealing with Native Nations, Na Native Nations is the only race of man that has not, never been supported by Amnesty okay mm -hmm. because of technicalities that I'd like to get into a little later briefly but we went to London and we were able to explain their their reasons why they denied Leonard's case okay why they were quiet with it and it was because of the violence so when we explained the self-defense and the attack on the people they had different point of views to where they gave us a five-point letter of the main points on why the Supreme Court judges should allow Leonard a new trial Okay, but regardless, we were still denied to the Supreme Court, but throughout that process now, Amnesty also come up with other excuses that uh, they couldn't do it because of technicalities after we cleared the violence concept, okay? So the, the, whole, the whole analysis of, to put it really briefly, is why they can't support Leonard's case technically is because you're dealing with a nation of people who are not recognized as a nation of people by an oppressed government, the United States government, under treaty law. And today that comes to be fact because we look at El Salvador, we look at Puerto Rico who is struggling for nationhood and we see how they mis miscredited the, the, the freedom the nationalists of Puerto Rico by putting them as terrorists and militants, you know. I mean, it's people's ways they speak out and for sure it's wrong. But how else do you get the attention of all the people who are out just worrying about their <laughs> lifestyles and don't have time to become involved with serious things? Well, serious course, issues, you know. Well, well, you've been to Geneva and the UN uh, about this case. Can you tell us about what about your experiences there? Yes. Well, um, after the trip to uh, uh, London to Amnesty International by Steve and one of our attorneys, uh, Lou Gerwitz, uh, there was a gathering at the Fourth uh, International Bertrand Russell Tribunal at which Steve again addressed uh, the body there. Later, I was asked uh, by the Defense Committee to represent our group, represent Leonard in Geneva. I traveled with the International Indian Treaty Council as a delegate of the Treaty Council, but as a representative of Leonard Peltier and the committee. I was able to address 
the entire body on two occasions. The International Treaty Council has non-governmental organization status, which is a non-voting, but yet there is a voice. And so I was one of the delegates to speak of, of the delegation. I addressed the entire body regarding Leonard Peltier. And <laughs> I was also able to come in because of my presentation uh, regarding Leonard and other native political prisoners. Uh, Dickie Marshall, Rita Silk Nonai, uh, David Ruiz. Uh, it created, along with the question of the indigenous people in Nicaragua, it created such an interest at the United Nations commissions that we were given a special session for political prisoners. At that point, I elaborated and, and made some concrete requests of the international bodies that they take on some some plans of action regarding Leonard Peltier. We were, believe, very successful in that the president of the uh, body there, Roma Chandra uh, from India, ended the conference by alluding to the symbol that Leonard had become to, uh, to the people by the witnessing of how the many representatives of Native nations uh, conducted themselves there in Geneva, and he ended the entire session with a poem that Leonard wrote in, in a British Columbia prison entitled, I Am the Indian Voice. As a result of that uh, successful meeting, as a result of us very clearly standing alongside the Sandinista government in their explanations of the question of indigenous people, which U.S. propaganda machines have tried to uh, portray in other ways to us here, we were, the International Indian Treaty Council was invited to Nicaragua uh, in December where the um, Third Assembly on Racial Discrimination, um, Recourses and Procedures on Racial Discrimination was held. Um, and again, I was asked as a representative of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee to serve as interpreter and translator uh, for the International Treaty Council. I did not, I was not able to present uh, to the entire body, but since we were guests of the Nicaraguan government and we had been very personal friends of Comandante Lumberto Campbell, um, I was able to do a, a very um, detailed and in-depth interview presentation on Sandino TV uh, regarding the case of Leonard Peltier and David Ruiz and Rainy Street here in Austin. So it was very mm -hmm. successful, and we have people that we have now. We don't have a committee there in Nicaragua, but we certainly have an information center where we send all our materials, and they're disseminating it. And a lot of Nicaraguan children are wearing free Peltier T-shirts, and so it was very beautiful. Well, this Peltier case is part of a mainstream of of violation of civil rights and genocide against Native Americans for years and years, but it's also part of the continuation of COINTELPRO program by the FBI, which has been going on for many, many decades against people of all uh, races and colors and uh, ways of thinking. Right. That's exactly what we're about, talking to people wherever we go all over this country and all over this world. We're trying to say to people, hey, you don't know that there was an Operation Bicent in 1976 when we were going across the country to Washington, D.C. to articulate our grievances to the U.S. government, directed primarily at the American Indian Movement and other uh, terrorist groups, as they called it. Uh, we also need to have people understand that the U.S. government and its law enforcement agencies against Native people had something called Operation Garden Plot and Operation Gar uh, Cable Splicer. People need to understand that these are not figments what of are, radicals' what imaginations. What but were these two operations? These were um, surveillance gathering and counterintelligence programs, internal, domestic, what do they call it, domestic surveillance programs, uh, aimed primarily um, at Indian people, uh, specifically after the Wounded Knee Siege of 1973. From that point on, uh, I believe 74 and 75 was Operation Garden Plot and Operation Cable Splicer. It's documented if people read, and especially on college campuses where we think people read, but somehow they don't read what, what's out there in the world. People need to read 
Now, there's many books on, on domestic surveillance, on counterintelligence programs. I mean, the Fred Hampton case. Those were real cases where police agencies violated.